Okay, see you on your phone. taken us a while to get sorted, but uh, welcome to you all, and uh, you obviously are occupying a seat, uh, look after it, and uh, do what I instruct you to do with your seat. Somebody can... Uh, Andre, you can pray and ask the Lord's blessing upon our talk to this morning. Our subject this morning is marriage, and uh, especially uh, Christian marriage. But by dealing with the subject, I feel like I'm walking on tiptoes through a minefield that's likely to explode in any time this morning. Why do I think that way? For three reasons. The New Zealand law permits what the Bible does not permit and we are speaking from the Bible. The New Zealand law allows things that, that, that the Bible does not permit us to do. And some people don't like that. They take exception to what I'm about to say because they Oh, we will. Okay. Um, the uh, people take exception uh, to uh, the Bible restricting things that the law permits. The second reason I'm doubtful of being able to speak and everybody will accept it because you are married, a lot of you, and you may think that I know a lot of, about your marriage and I'm using you as an example. I can assure you that I'm not using anybody's example, least, least of all our marriage that we have had for 56 years. The third reason I'm <coughs> fearful of the result that 50% of the population 
does not like a man telling them anything about marriage. They have their own ideas and they want to hear it from a female. But I crave your patience and acceptance of the scriptures and prayer and moral support of the rest. I am a man and I'm addressing the uh, subject because the scriptures say a lot about marriage. But I want to, you to say in your mind a little uh, lithy saying and then we'll, we, we will repeat it together. The uh, pithy saying that I want you to think about as distinction of role is not a measure of worth. A distinction of role, R-O-L-E, a distinction of role is not a measure of worth. Can you say that together? A distinction of role is not a measure of worth. A distinction of role is not a measure of worth. This morning we have a, a number of uh, parts that you are going to, particip to participate in, but I want to select an Adam and I've chosen an Adam, it's a typical Adam figure. Will you please come forward? <laughs> Look at him. <laughs> Adam. Looks like the picture from last night. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, am, uh, I, am, um, I have a better picture because I have the reality. He only had a drawing. <laughs> I have the reality. But <clears throat> Adam had a wife, Eve. Can you please come forward? Wow. Thank you for participating. <coughs> I'm going to do a deal with the subject in three stages. As it was, as it is now, and it, as it will be in the future. Past, present, and future. Remember, a distinction of role is not a measure of worth. Nobody can say one woman is valuable of two men and compare the roles that they have and measure their worth. As it was <clears throat> in the past, we will look at this story and I will tell you the story because once upon a time, a long time ago, 
When the world was young, there were two people named Adam and Eve. The scripture says, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, cre he created them. God created two people in his image. There is a, a danger today from many uh, sides. If you feel filled in the census forms a couple of months ago, you will have a list of people, sex, male, female, binary, trans, and a, a number of options. God's word says it clearly. Male and female created he them. There is only in God's sight males and females. Think of what's happened in our world. In the States, they voted Woman of the Year, and the man won. <laughs> they had a beauty contest in one of the States, and the man won. A uh, man won the swimming races in national competitions swimming in the female races. And he got a cup and he won first place. We live in a different world and they are threatening to have a genderless row up the middle. Your kids are being taught at many schools, it doesn't matter what your parents say about your gender, you are free to choose what you say you are. And it is an, a direct attack on an effort to do away with godly distinctions in the name of being diverse, liberal, able to choose whatever you feel like in your heart. It is a defiant move in our society and it's rampant in New Zealand at the present time in an effort to destroy marriage and the family and all distinctions based on gender. Uh, a number of people on, in, in your work are finding to address certain people in your workplace, you have to use specific pronouns that are genderless. God made us, men and women, in specific areas. We seated the, uh, the group in a, ma a manner that we are drawing attention that we are women and men, males and females, by design of the Creator.
that Adam, looking at Eve, <clears throat> when he uh, saw uh, f her for the first time, he said, this is now bone of my bones <laughs> and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to, one, uh, to his wife, and they will come one flesh. These couple, what was it like when they lived in the Garden of Eden? God co-created a specific place for them to be. It was perfect. It was peaceful. It was as, as everything that you could uh, desire. God used words about leader, leadership, helper, submission that are based on gender. Marriage was God's idea. These couple didn't grow up as children, they were created as adults. And they were created married. Because God said, that is the best for the couple that I have made. And he called it good, very good. God was del delighted with the result. He said, this is magnificent, the work that I have made. I have created Adam and Eve and them, given them everything in the Garden of Eden. What was their life like? in the Garden of Eden. First of all, they had intellectual equality. They could use their brains. They had unique <coughs> moral potential. Same for Adam and Eve. They had unique spiritual awareness. So far, Adam and Eve are equal. But they had different roles. And that did not get in the way of the equal part of them. They had specific gender-related roles. Adam was to be the head of the woman, and she was to be the partner of the man. You can't have one without the other. And it worked marvelously because Adam and Eve, without um, any uh, difficulty, talked with God day by day. They communed as friends with the almighty God, the creator, day by day. 
what would have that have been for them? To look forward as in the cool of the evening to the privilege of communicating, sharing with the Almighty God, the God of the universe, the God who owned everything, and they were friends of God. And the <clears throat> There was a tree of life in the garden. God's ambition, God's plan was for them to eat of it and live forever in communion with Almighty God. Imagine. God desired the friendship, the fellowship, the communion, the interchange of intellects forever. The Garden of Eden was a perfect residence. They slept well. They ate well. They lived without problems. And they didn't have a, a mortgage. <laughs> Nothing disturbed the peace and quietness and harmony of life in the Garden of Eden. Can you imagine how blessed they were in that situation? And it's called paradise. Paradise. But one day, a sad day, everything changed. How did this come about? One day, Eve went walk about, not too far away, but Eve went to visit in the garden, and she had an encounter with a being that was so beautiful so wonderful, so plausible, so intelligent. And he, he kind of uh, chatted with Eve about what she had heard. And he, he said to her, hmm, has God said? And he listened to Eve's version of that. And he says, what sort of God is he? He wants to put a curb on your desires. He wants to make rules that restrict you from not doing something. And Eve listened, and she looked, and she thought about it. She said to herself, that fruit looks good, looks good. And she ate of the tree 
it was prohibited by God. The only tree that she was not to eat of, she ate of it. Listen to what she did. She was convinced in her mind <coughs> that Satan was more truthful than God. And she ate of this fruit. As we say, <clears throat> she swallowed the bait, hook, line, and sinker. <laughs> she swallowed everything. She was scammed. She was scammed. She um, was deceived in her thinking and her mind in a way that she chose this fruit and destroyed the peace of the Garden of Eden in a way that she didn't realize much of what she was doing because she immediately went to Adam with the good news. I've eaten. He didn't need to be told. Adam saw Eve with the fruit and he saw Eve, Eve offering the same fruit to Adam. Adam has a different problem. Eve, the Bible says, <clears throat> Adam was not deceived. It was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner. That's, they are strong words. The woman was deceived and became a sinner. Adam made a choice. Adam, he had a choice to make and he made it in a split second. He looked at Eve. Yes? <laughs> And he decided, I can't live without her. I can't live without her. And he made a choice to prefer her in the, her disobedience of God's command and he made a willful choice to participate in the same fruit. Eve was sucked in to the mistake. Adam made a, a definite choice to commit an error and his sin is much more significant in responsibility and responsibility as well. So we see them <clears throat> that Adam has decided to go with Eve and everything 
changed. Everything in the world of their paradise changed. Now, I want you to do something. I am going to move these people, Adam and Eve, to these chairs. And I want you to turn your chair 90 degrees into the center. a certain sort of chemistry going on because it's a daunting sight when you are confronted with a group of females <laughs> and a group of males. The tree. What changed? The Garden of Eden was closed. Every time that Adam and Eve moved by the entrance of the Garden of Eden, they said, we used to live here. We used to live here. But things have changed. Things have changed in a big way. <clears throat> the sense of unity has changed. Because Adam and Eve, it's no longer we together, it's you and I, blame and shame. We are not a team. Rivalry and competition were the name of the game. From this time forward, including us, rival and rival, rivalry and competition between the sexes is the name of the game. There was a rival, a rivalry, a desire. to have the upper hand. God, <coughs> God had a special word. For these, the couple, Adam and Eve. They were punished on the basis of gender. Gender. Female and male. And he punished them in ways that they differed in their sins. The, uh, the account of their sin, she was sucked in, he was willfully disobedient, God punished them gender-wise in a way that is very specific to the manner of their sins. There's a specific sin for the females 
and a specific sin for the males. And God said, in the day that you eat it, you shall die. God's words to this couple were a death sentence. The judge of all the earth is pronouncing a death sentence for the females and a specific death sentence to the males. And we are still under it. Every female born on the earth is under that specific sin, um, a death sentence. Every male has a death sentence in their being. When you are born, male and female, you take in your bodies a death sentence throughout your life. You cannot avoid it. Whatever stage of history, whatever language group, nationality, culture you have, all females are under the specific judgment of God in a specific way that only females are judged. Every male is under a specific word of God as a result of their sin. For the females, he said, to the woman, I will greatly increase your pains in childbearing. With pain, you will give birth to your children. No male can participate in female birth pains. They can be sympathetic. They can be present but they cannot specifically um, identify with a female in her birth pains. It's of a woman. But listen carefully. carefully. To the most misunderstood word and the, the, the Lord said your desire will be for your husband your desire will be for your de husband it's a death penalty it's not something positive. It's not a, a word that uh, your desire be for your husband is something that you can do and negate or minimize the penalty. Because the word is only used twice in Genesis and it means entrap, ensnare, catch and conquer, manipulate, entice, seduce. 
every lady, every female, has within her, her, herself a desire to snare males. And that's very difficult for the ladies to be conscious of. It is inborn into all females the ability to provide a trap for the, uh, males. And the male, the uh, words that the Lord said, he will rule over you. Every male is born with an inbuilt desire to put down, squash, demean, overcome females, conquer. Every male has that urge to have the upper hand over the female population. That explains a lot of things that go on in wartime. Males raping females. Males dominating, treating as dirt females. Throwing their weight around in order to squash females. Males have an urge to get it over females. You are looking at the enemy. You are looking at the competition. You are looking at people who have at heart a desire to compete and fight against each other. We cannot avoid having this desire. It's the punishment of Almighty God upon the sexes based on gender. If people understood more of this verse, they have, would have an understanding of how problematic marriage can be and what the solution is. The females are uh, out to seduce. We have nations in our world. I will use Afghanistan. They, all Muslims, have a desire for Sharia law. Even the Muslims in Christchurch, their desire is for Sharia law to be worldwide. They have a desire to conquer and the, the law that they have is woman clothed in ma ma um, eyes uncovered but clothed in a garment specific sort of uh, dress in Saudi Arabia a woman cannot have a driver's license the women are put down by the men in such a way that is male oriented the world, in a big part, 
suffers with woman being dominated by men. And men want to have the world in their control and woman in their place, as they say. That's a terrible situation. For the males that God said, to Adam he said, because you listened to your wife and ate from the tree, which I commanded you, you must not eat of it. Cursed be the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food, and you will return to the ground, since from it you will, were taken. For dust you are, and dust you shall return. Every male has the curse of the land in the workplace, in the desire to provide for his family, the desire to uh, prove in the workplace, he has the world against him. It cannot be be a free ride to earn your money. You will have problems that are uh, the cause related to the sin you committed through Adam, the federal head of the human race. So when you work you can expect difficulties, things to crop out that make your life, because you are men, males, difficult to, or in order to have a living. That's by design because God has said it in his word. Wow. <clears throat> what a predicament. The Garden of Eden seems to be so close. Yet, we have moved on in history. We have reaped the consequences of the Garden of Eden. But what does the Christian believe the Bible teach about our position? To the sisters, the females. The Bible in the New Testament teaches wives, Submit to your husbands as to the Lord. Wives are not told to love their husbands. That's a given for the ladies. They will love males when they don't deserve it. <laughs> But they struggle with the word submission. Submission has nothing to do with a man telling his wife what to do, demanding that she do something and always go his way. It has nothing to do 
with submission. Submission is an attitude of a heart willingly accepted to be a partner and a support for her husband. Not every man, she is required to be a support for her husband. Because the obvious antidote to seduction is submission. The, the New Testament provides, uh, provides a remedy that none, none other thing provides. If you submit and be a partner to, you can't seduce a person you are submitting to at fighting against yourself. But husbands are told, husbands love your wives. Only men are told to love their wives because the man has a desire to put down and squash and dominate because he's stronger, put down there, he, has requir he is required to love his wife. But it says in the scripture, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy. Every male has the ability to look at the person of Christ and respond to the love of Christ, his sacrificial love on the cross, and say, that's the model for my wife. Men, we have a long way to go. Many of you are not married. You are young people, and I applaud your being at this session. It is awfully important for you young people, young males, in the Lord's time to seek a Christian female because you cannot love in a way that is Christian love your wives if she is not a Christian you need to have girlfriends in your stage of life in the future only Christians are options for you. You need to hear it from a man, not your mother. You need to hear it from a man. You need to be close to the idea that if you marry a non-Christian, you are combining, trying to combine light with darkness. And it does not work. Be fearful of Satan putting in your minds 
that any girl is a girl and able to be my friend. You can have friends with, but I'm talking about marriage. Put it in your heart and store it in your heart. I will be pure in my life and save myself for the girl you have chosen for me. If you do that, you have 50% of the battle won. The Lord has given his all for us. The Lord has given his utmost for us. Every male is told, love your female. It's not an option. The measure of your love is Christ's love that we celebrate week by week in our church with the Lord's Supper. He gave himself for us all. That is the measure of your love, the intensity of your love for your wife. Because our desire is to squash the woman, put her down. But you can't love sacrificially at the same time you are putting down your wife. Submission is a battle that, a gender-related battle that the ladies, the females, have to fight. It's a heartfelt response to the husband. But the men have, um, um, the ladies have a, a battle against submission because submission is the remedy to seduction. But the males have a battle with love. The measure of you like if you look in your mirror day by day and decide what you would like for the day, turn it to your wife's desires. Turn it around. If I desire such and such in my life, my wife has a need as well, and supply them needs in your thoughts and in your action. Because loving your wife is the best antidote of aggression, a desire to put down. If you love her, and give her her place, you are acting out the, uh, the exact way that God has intended males to act. What will it be? We have looked at our past, present, and future. I would invite you to turn your chairs to the front.
I want to say this. I have a, a sign reserved for God, <clears throat> because Christ has loved the world and he has chosen a group of people to be in his body. But he also uses the figure of the bride. He is the bridegroom seeking to have a bride. Ephesians. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing of the water through the word, and to present her as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. There is a reserved sec uh, section in life. Christ is seeking people, men and women, to be part of his bride. He wants everyone to be part of his bride. And I want to offer you this morning the opportunity, male, male and female, if you have never accepted Christ, if you don't have the assurance that Christ is in your life, in your heart to join this reserved section and come to the Lord in a way that is not gender related, it's world related of the human race. We have started off with the tree of life in the Garden of Eden. The tree of life also appears in the celestial city. It's God's desire that every human being have the option of participating of that tree of life. Will you accept the Lord's offer? He uses marriage as a symbol of the choice. You are going, if you have not accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, I don't know what your position is at present. You may be young or old or older. Everybody needs the Lord. Everybody. Jesus died to save the world. The reserved selection is for you. You don't need to say, stay in the world. You can move from the world to here. The Lord is offering that today. If you have something stirring in your heart, 
a desire to commit your life. Maybe you know about the Bible, but you have never physically accepted the Lord as your Savior. We are offering you the opportunity to do that. Marriage is good, but the bridegroom awaits to have the bridegroom, uh, the bride, with himself. One day we will hear the shout, and the Lord will come to seek his bride, and we will be invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb, a glorious opportunity to share eternity with the Lord. If you don't, you will not be there. Your residence will be in hell, and there is no neutral place. It's heaven or hell. The tree of life or death. And it's serious. Camp is a gift. This place has seen hundreds of people come to the Lord. Marty can vouch for that. Today is a day of the salvation. Will you accept the Lord as your personal saviour? My story is finished. And thank you for the way you have listened. And may the Lord bless you all thinking. Thank you.